Hello, podcast fam. I am so grateful that you're here listening and could not be more excited to share this episode with you. Our guest today is my dear friend, Patrick Murphy, who I will tell you all about in a minute, but I'm just going to say, like, we were on fire in this conversation, so this is seriously going to be like, you may listen to this one more than once, you may want to jot down notes if you're in a safe place to do so. This was a seriously excellent conversation, so I am so thrilled to share it with you and for you to get to know Patrick. So before we jump into that, let me talk about what I've been watching, reading, and loving recently. I started the show Psych, which is like an ancient show at this point by modern standards. It's like 2006, I think seven or eight seasons, and very well known. I'd heard of it, but never watched it. And I love just that kind of like silly energy in a show. It kind of has like a similar energy to me to like Buffy and Angel and bones and that kind of thing. So I'm digging it. And also I might start watching Sharp Objects soon at a strong recommendation. So let me know if you're a fan of either one. And I recently started reading the book Sidewalk Oracles, Playing with Signs, Symbols, and Synchronicity in Everyday Life by Robert Moss. And Robert is sort of a, he brings together dream work and shamanism and he is from Australia originally and just has a very interesting life story, is a hilarious writer and just so powerful with his words. I'm really enjoying the book and that connects with what I'm loving recently, which is kind of just reconnecting to a sense of play and magic in everyday life, like following the breadcrumbs and being like, oh my gosh, I had no idea I was going here, but here I am. This is so fun. This feels so right. So that's been really fun and I seriously love the book. I'm gonna check into some of his online courses with the Shift Network, because as you'll hear in the convo with me and Patrick, can't stay away from those courses. It just can't do it. Let's see, later today I am heading out of town to the DC, Arlington, Virginia area to go to the Emdria conference. I love in-person training so much and an opportunity to connect with people IRL. Emdria stands for the Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing International Association. (laughs) It's insane. It's a mouthful. But EMDR is an extremely powerful therapy modality, and I am certified and want to get all my little CE credits to keep my certification up and learn even more about what's evolving in the field of trauma work and EMDR therapy. So super excited for that. And then before I tell you more about Patrick, I have one more very exciting announcement that on September 30th, I will be hosting a free masterclass called Life's a Bitch, Be the Bigger Bitch, (laughs) Cultivating Resilience Amidst Chaos. I cannot wait for this. It is going to be my first free masterclass in this type of setting and sort of the coaching world. Like I've done workshops in person and trainings in person, but I haven't really like gone all in with hosting and really promoting an online event like this. So I'm really excited, little nervous, but feel really just ready to host something like this. And really it is in celebration of the doors reopening for my Lit AF membership. So you'll be hearing more about that soon as well. And there will be giveaways at the masterclass, both for people who attend live and those who watch the replay. So more will be announced soon on that and also even might already be announced by the time you're listening to this. I am recording this a couple weeks before it airs. So this is the first that I am speaking any of this into the universe. It's Very exciting for me, but there may already be more info by the time you're listening to this on my Instagram, on my email list, my weekly emails. So check that out. And if you would like to register for the free masterclass, it is at bit.ly slash be the bigger bitch. <laughs> I love that I got that URL. It's all lowercase bit.ly slash be the bigger bitch. And that will be in the show notes. Okay, let me tell you more about Patrick, who is one of my favorite people in the world. And I have never met him IRL. We're actually going to meet for the first time in person. He's coming to Nashville for a wedding 
in October. And so we'll get to meet finally in person. But we've been close friends for over three years now and really bonded in those early COVID times after a, a mutual friend introduced us and have been like, close business friends and just it's a friendship that I am so grateful for and a collaboration and and if you listen all the way to the end of the episode you'll hear about a collaboration that we are super jazzed about that did not exist until we started talking about it on this podcast but we we make shit happen so watch for this to come in 2024 and listen to the end of the episode to hear about what it's going to be but Patrick does one-on-one -on -one coaching and offers other things like masterminds. And he has shared with me some testimonials from his Healing Anxiety Mastermind. And I'm like, holy shit, like you're on to something here. Because like we talk about a little bit in this conversation, it's not that therapy is bad and that it doesn't, I mean, clearly it has a place, especially with diagnosable conditions. And the coaching world can offer a lot to get outside of the traditional sort of talk therapy realm, especially for people whom that just hasn't been all that helpful or successful with. So I think very highly of Patrick's work and he will be starting that next cohort of his Healing Anxiety Mastermind soon. So message him at murph.live on Instagram if you have questions about that or one-on-one -on -one coaching. That's M-U-R-P-H dot live on Instagram. And I'm gonna read this little bio that I just made up because I was like, hey, by the way, can you send me your bio literally right now? Because I have to record the intro right now because I'm about to pack up and head out of town and I don't wanna have to take this fancy mic with me. So he is gonna send me like an official one that you can read in the show notes, but I just made this up because I was like, I know you, it's fine. So here's the bio that I made up for Patrick. Patrick Murphy is a somatic coach who supports his clients in healing anxiety and the wounds that created a small, self-protective way of living that's no longer serving them so they can step fully into who they are meant to be, the connections they are meant to have, and the gifts they are meant to share. All right, enjoy this conversation with Patrick Murphy. Patrick Murphy, thank you so much for being here. I'm super excited to chat with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for the invitation. <laughs> So I'm going to start with how I sometimes like to start these episodes, which is what does it mean to you to be a bad bitch? And like, <laughs> just, <laughs> All right. that may not be your preferred terminology, so you can tell us what is, but I have a sense that you have a phenomenal answer to this question anyway. Well, you know, I mean, as someone who's considered himself a bad bitch for his entire life, no, I'm just kidding. I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to co-opt that term in any way, shape or form, but <laughs> But like you said, I do have kind of a feel for it. And and really, to me, like what being a bad bitch means is just telling the truth. Mm -hmm. It's telling the truth and it's living your truth. And it's, mm -hmm. it's those two things. And I think if you align with those two things, then like you're absolutely embodying that bad bitch energy. And yeah. it's going to piss some people off, but it's also going to attract a lot of people to you. Because like, it's, you know, it, it, it's going to illuminate the shadows that you don't want to see, sure. that the person doesn't want to see. And that's why so often when somebody does tell the truth, when they're living so authentically and so in line, like with their truth and with their purpose, and they do that so unapologetically, it pisses people off because, the, you know, like subconsciously, they're just sitting there being like, I wish I could do that. And because I'm not doing that, I'm going to tear you down. Right. Exactly. Sometimes I struggle with the idea of like being contentious just for the sake of being contentious, like how popular it is nowadays to have an unpopular opinion, LOL, yeah. paradox, right? And, and like I am out there having unpopular opinions, wanting to share them. And it isn't, I have to like talk myself out of that. I'm like, no, I'm not just trying to be difficult or contentious for the sake of it. But it's like, yeah, in living your truth, sometimes like that's a part of it is going like, it's important for me to own this. Right. And I'm going to say it. And like, if you don't like it, that's cool. You don't have to like everything I say. You don't have to follow me. But like, I have a new little series I've started doing called say it louder, where I'm just like, let's talk about the shit that's maybe uncomfortable for people to hear. Yes, please. Yes, please. Like that. Well, and, and really what you're getting at, because I mean, you and I were, were obviously both coaches and and yes, like if you, you know, take a, 
a coaching course or a marketing course for coaches or whatever, they're going to tell you to be polarizing. But the thing is like, there's a reason for that. Like, I don't love polarization just for the sake of polarization. Yes. It's, it's the, the fact is most people are gravitating towards the middle 50% because we're all seeking Mm. safety, belonging, and dignity in every single moment of our lives. And that causes us to gravitate towards the middle 50%. But what telling the truth does and what being a bad bitch, you know, does is it pokes at the edges And so what you're talking about is like having that controversial opinion, it pokes at the edges and the edges where the growth is, the edges where people really truly at their hearts want to be, but they're afraid to go there. But telling the truth and doing what you're doing and and bringing up that controversial opinion or say it louder. Yeah. Say it louder because people need to hear it. Mm. People need to hear it. And it's so interesting because as you're saying all of that, I'm like, I a hundred percent agree. And I'm like, how does that fit in with all of like the divisiveness, right? The fact that we're sort of like notoriously living in the most divisive period, perhaps since the civil war in this country. And, and so there's certainly arguments to be made for finding middle ground for, you know, being able to say the person who's way over there on the other side, I'm not just going to call them an idiot and say that I know everything and they know nothing. Like, I'm going to be curious about, wow, their opinion is very different from mine. But like, I think there's a way of holding that dialectic of pushing those edges of owning and not just like sort of contorting to find something in the middle that's pleasing and agreeable for everyone. But that doesn't have to mean that we can never meet somewhere and come across that divide. Yeah. And and I I mean, we obviously see this with politics. We see it with religion. And I think what you're getting at, there's there's kind of, well, obviously there's two sides to this, but uh, (laughs) maybe not in the way that uh, people are thinking at the moment. I'm going to go in a different direction with this, like, and break this down because I love to break things down. What, you know, what you're talking about. So, all right, let's go back to this seeking belonging, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is what we are seeing right now. Like we're seeing you know, the disconnection that has been so fueled by te- technology and social media. And so people are then sitting behind their computers, looking at all of this incredibly divisive political stuff. And they're looking for something that reinforces a sense of identity that they already possess. And yeah. when they find that, they're like, yes, these are my people. Here we go. And then you turn on that algorithmic fire hose and it just pours gasoline mm-hmm. on the fire. And, and, but the difference is that this is seeking belonging outside of ourselves. Mm. But what a good coach, what a good therapist, what a good guy does is they help, they guide people to seek belonging within themselves because the divisiveness that we're seeing right now is fueled by this like finger pointing yeah. of they are wrong. I am right. Follow me and you will get your sense of belonging affirmed. Mm -hmm. But what happens when that political leader, that religious leader, whomever it is, and uh, we actually, we see this a lot in the coaching industry, in the spiritual world too, right? Like the rise of the guru, the rise of the guru. And we're seeing that a lot of this is driven by a decline in trust in our institutions. Like, Decline in trust in government, decline in trust in the health system, decline in trust in religion, whatever it might be. And so there's this void that's been created where people really are truly searching for safety, dignity, and belonging. Yeah. And because of that void, we've kind of had this, not kind of, we've absolutely had this rise of, let's say, like the Instagram guru, right? Like the spiritual coach, you know, whatever. And it gives people a sense of meaning. It gives people a sense yeah. of purpose. It is feeling filling that void. But the the key is, you know, well, are you, are you filling this outside of yourself or are you filling this inside of yourself? Yeah. Tell me who I am. Tell me where I can belong tell me what I believe. Yeah. If that's Mm -hmm. what you're looking for, then it will push you toward the edges, but not in a way that ultimately creates any real opportunity for connection across differences. 
I'm thinking of, was it Braving the Wilderness, that book by Bernie Brown, where she talks about like being kind of the lone wolf and like yes. that when you don't want to just conform, like sometimes you're gonna not belong and like that sucks. But like owning that rather than just needing to seek identity and belonging in our ideological bunkers, as she calls them, it's like we have to do that. And so I think in a way when I'm sharing like a unpopular opinion or something like that, it's more inviting people into going, hey, if you thought that because you've been told this forever, that that, that just is the truth, like 100% all the time, let's think about it this way instead, right? Inviting people into expanding their perspectives, not to just agreeing with me. Right. And well, it reminds me of what Glennon Doyle says. Strong beliefs, loosely held. Mm, oh, yeah. I forgot that one. That is so good. Yeah. And I love that. I love that. And it, and it's just, yes, like, let's always be learning. Let's always be evolving. You know, mm -hmm. like there's, there's I, the, my spidey senses go haywire and, and fire all at once whenever I hear just something that is an absolute of like, yeah. this is the absolute truth or this political ideology is the absolute truth when really we we agree on so much more than we actually disagree on like if you sit down and just have a conversation and start it with hey do you like pizza yeah i like pizza Wait, oh, okay well it's like phoebe and friends right when she meets her mom and she's like all pissed off at her and and then you know at some point you know, her mom's like, well, do you like pizza? And she's like, Phoebe's like, I, I, I yeah, I like pizza. And then God, <laughs> they came together over that and they bridged right. this like massive divide. Yeah. But like another thought that's bouncing around in my head right now, as you're talking is that really people want permission to be themselves mm -hmm. and they first and foremost want that, but they also want permission to chase their dreams mm -hmm. and everybody's kind of, kind of running around again, gravitating towards that middle 50% because that's what we're quote unquote told to do. And then that reaches this tipping point where, you know, their, like their inner self, like their wise self is kind of screaming so much of them, but they've also suppressed so much of it down that their bodies are physically reacting to it. And, you know, that comes out in the form of like anxiety, perfectionism, you know, all yep. these different things. And, but but really at the core, like people want permission to chase their dreams and they want permission to chase their dreams in the most authentic way that aligns for them. Because how right. many people do you and I, that, I mean, how you and I have actually both done this. Like you, we love courses, right? You and I love courses, <laughs> but you, but you sign up for a course, you know, and this coach is like, yeah, like I'm making seven figures and I'll show you how to do it and blah, 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 blah. And you get into this and you're like, none of this feels good to me. Mm. Like, that's great for you that you did it this way, but I don't want to do it this way. Right. And, and that's what people are really looking for is just like, and, and you're right. It, it is so lonely. Like it can feel so isolating, but I would say most of us know that feeling of really being seen in the moment when, you know, that person kind of like slides over to you at the party and like whispers, you're like, I'm not really having fun here. Are you having any fun? No, I'm not having any <laughs> fun either. And that's just like a tiny example. And you can take that so much deeper where, you know, in a moment, somebody like you really do feel permission to be yourself, to permission to express, permission to move through the world in a way that authentically aligns, aligns with you. And that's both freeing and it can also be pretty isolating too, because then it's like, well, shoot, now I know what this feeling is like. And I really, I got to go find my people, but there's a gap and you're in a void yep. for a little while. And it's so important that you be held in that void, whether it be, you know, just a friend. And it's like, nobody has to necessarily know the answers. But, you know, a friend, a therapist, a coach, you know, whatever it might be, just be like, hey, I'm with you here. Like, I'm with yeah. you in this liminal space as you transition from the middle 50% to the edges of your growth, to the edges of your truth, and align with your authenticity, align with your dreams. And yeah. And, and get them. 
the truth is that there's anxiety and discomfort no matter where you are on that spectrum, right? Yes. Either at the edges, it's holy shit, this is like, uh, there's going to be people who don't like what I'm saying or what I'm doing. There's going to be people who don't want to hang out with me, don't want to hire me, don't approve of me, whatever. But in yeah. the middle, which is what we're just sort of accustomed to, because again, it's like that first that first sense before we really reach those higher levels of self-understanding and authenticity and actualizing and all that is just like, I got to belong somewhere, right? And so we're used to that type of anxiety. But if we stay there forever, we stay there too long, then we're getting the type of anxiety and discomfort that comes with squishing yourself into something that is not actually you. And, and so it's like, if we can just acknowledge it that way of like, hey, either any choice that you make here, there's, we're going to have to learn how to make room for anxiety and discomfort. Which one do you want? Yeah. Yeah. Like, do you want authentic anxiety or do you want the <laughs> inauthentic anxiety? Right. Well, but, but really what you're getting at. Is, so, so like the anxiety of, you know, I'll keep coming. I'll just kind of use this example of like the middle 50%, like as, as the core point, mm. that anxiety is so exhausting because you're constantly having to wake up or in any given moment in the day being like, what mask do I need to put on right now so that I can show up for this other person or this group and belong and yep. oops, sorry, not belong, fit in. Mm, yes. Fit in, yeah. Not belong. Going back to Brene Brown's, you mm -hmm. know, definition of, you know, fitting in versus belonging, you know, fitting in requires you to change who you are. Belonging re requires you to be who you are. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge difference. Fitting in is exhausting. Like I've been there, I've been there, you know, and, and we constantly, you know, it's this process. Like we constantly have to catch ourselves in it. And I, I think like a core point of anxiety is, you know, so many, I mean, it's talked about so much these days because everybody has various forms of, let's say, unaddressed or maybe unhealed anxiety, but anxiety at the core isn't a bad thing. Like anxiety is there to tell you something. Anxiety is, you know, someone wave, it's your body waving the flag saying like, Hey, like maybe we either slow down a little bit here, or it's just saying like, this is not for me. Like there's a disconnect. Like you have now left your authentic self and you are living, you know, with this mask on and that doesn't feel good. Or anxiety could be, you know, a, a sense of impending danger, which could be very real. Like if you're walking through the woods without a flashlight at night and you can't see anything and there's all sorts of you know potential like creatures around <laughs> like i live in colorado we have mountain lions mountain lions are terrifying like there's a very real sense of anxiety that does belong in your body in that moment but the key is addressing the anxiety whether it be caused, you know, from childhood trauma or even just in a moment of like living inauthentically, like that's the anxiety that we want to look at. That's the anxiety that we want to address that. I mean, I want everybody to hear this. You can heal that anxiety. You can shift that anxiety. And it's about expanding our capacity to be with the emotions and resourcing ourselves to be with the emotions underneath that anxiety. Yeah. And I love that you use the phrase healing anxiety because historically in sort of our like CBT driven psychotherapy world, it's, we talk about managing anxiety, controlling anxiety. Like I think some people might think of like mastering or dominating your anxiety. And I'm just like, yeah, absolutely. Eek, like that energy of that. It tends to be like the Chinese finger trap or the vines from Harry Potter, right? That the, the more you, you really are trying to fight it, the, the harder it is to get out of it. So like you're saying, it's creating that larger capacity for it. And I am curious with your term healing anxiety, I'm like, what is what does that mean sort of like philosophically in the sense of like, I don't imagine you're saying that a person can learn a certain set of tools or expand themselves to a point where they will heal anxiety and never experience it again. So what is your sense of like, what's our goal here? If we can't do that, what are, what are we trying to do? I Really, I think the goal 
is the ability and the capacity to be with our anxiety. Like that's first and foremost. And mind you, this is, this is a multi-layered, multi-step process that actually just kind of repeats itself over and over again. But, you know, for anybody listening, it's a podcast, obviously I'm doing a hand motion where I'm spiraling upwards, mm-hmm. like, like a tornado and you'll go through the same cycles over and over again, but each one gets a little bit easier. Each one can get a little bit lighter as you rise in the process, but it depends on your viewpoint of, are you looking at the tornado from the side where you can actually see it moving upwards? Or are you looking at it from the top down where it literally just looks like a spiral? Mm. And it looks like you're spiraling in the same thing over and over again. This is a horrible analogy for me to use on an audio based. <laughs> well, there will be video, but gosh, it, you know, it's interesting. I, I yeah, I mean, perspective is everything, yes. but it also in that analogy, this might be the opposite of where you are taking it, but it makes me think of the eye of the storm and oh my God, like cue yep. the eye by Brandy Carlisle. But it like that there is something about when you can, it, it, I guess in the eye, you're observing it, right? You're not yep. caught up in the chaos of the mm-hmm. whirlwind. And so when we can find that, when we can develop those skills of perspective taking and expanding our capacity to hold uncomfortable shit in our bodies, then yes. like, that's it. That's really all we're talking about. Yeah. And and that's the key is, is that so often, because anxiety doesn't feel great. Like we can all agree on that. It doesn't feel <laughs> great. And because of that, our tendency is to just run from it. But guess what? Like anxiety is going to keep chasing you down. It's just, it's not going to go away, you know, if you run from it, but, and, and I actually teach this in my anxiety mastermind where it's just this visual of like, what if we just go and we just sit next to it? And mind you, mm-hmm. there's breathing exercises and somatic sure. exercises Prep work and for that. things that, that I teach and and this is the resourcing. So, you know, when we talk about resourcing, whether it be in coaching or therapy, this is it. Well, I have this breathing exercise. That is one of my resources. Another resource could be going on a walk. Another resource could be screaming into a pillow. There's all sorts. I mean, the, the, there's a laundry list of things that you can resource yourself with. And the key is to have those resources. I often encourage my clients to just have them. Some of them literally have them as their phone background because Mm -hmm. they're in certain states that they they're getting pretty continually triggered and they just really need to be able to go immediately back to something that's outside of their bodies. Cause you know, it's like you get triggered, your prefrontal cortex goes offline And, you know, for anybody listening, like your prefrontal cortex is the center of your executive functioning. Like that's, that's the part of your brain that actually develops last. That's why you can't rent a car before you're 25 years old. (laughs) Your brain literally is not all there. And like, this is why teenagers make stupid decisions. Oh God. Yeah. Because their prefrontal cortex isn't fully formed. (laughs) There's also a lot of adults that make super stupid decisions and we question whether or not their prefrontal <laughs> cortex is fully formed, right? Right. But but it's it's about just you know having that split second of awareness to where you can say, okay, am I going to run f- from this or am I going yeah. to be with this? I'm interrupting the pod very briefly for a quick message about how to work with me. If you enjoy this podcast, then we would probably be a great fit working together. I would love to support you, whether you are a leader, a business owner, or just someone who wants to crush some of your goals over the next few months. Let's talk. I have several programs and would love to tell you more about them and learn what you are wanting to work toward. You can shoot me a DM, an email, find me online at badbitchtherapist.co. All right, let's get back to the episode. And the other like kind of tricky nuance of that though, is that there's also a difference between being with this and what I often kind of phrase is like, get on that train and ride it all the way down, like ruminating and sort of willfully staying in that because worry is our, it's a very natural process. It's kind of like our default mode process for yes. attempting to actually su- short circuit anxiety because my worry is attempting to find a way out of this feeling because if I can figure it out, solve it, et cetera, then maybe I cannot feel this way, right? So it's like 
again, worry itself isn't doesn't mean that you'll you should never worry again, but noticing when, okay, am is this rumination right now actually like helpful problem solving, or am yeah. I circling the drain? And in which case, how could I be like, thanks, brain, for trying to get me out of this uncomfortable feeling? Don't know that your way is going to work. So I'm just going to hold the anxiety right here. I'm going to shift my focus to my breath or to this like beautiful lamp over here and and just allow it to be there without having to be like, oh my God, right? Or running from it. Yeah, well, and, and it's uh, like the Byron Katie, right? With the work, the first question of her four questions is, is this true? Is this true? And we can ask ourselves in any given moment, like, well, is it true? And, and I'll, just, I'll just give a personal example. So in my neighborhood, I live one house off of this intersection, and there have been two car wrecks in that intersection in the last like three years. They actually mm. occurred within three weeks of each other, one wow. of which was like very horrific. And like I ended up saving a kid's life in, you know, with that car wreck. Thankfully, I was home. But every single time, and again, this is my intersection. I go through this yeah. every day, sometimes multiple times a day. I stop at the stop sign. And I can physically feel the anxiety rising within me as I'm looking left and right to make sure no other cars are coming because I'm like, this is the intersection where wrecks happen. Like that's the subconscious programming in my brain mm -hmm. from the past. Mind you, I have lived in this house for eight years. There've been two wrecks. They're within three weeks of each other. Like this is not the world's deadliest intersection. <laughs> like I'm probably going to be fine in this intersection for the rest of my life. Real threat versus perceived threat. Exactly. Right. And that's, the, and I actually catch myself in these moments and I know what I'm doing, mm -hmm. but I'm like, okay, is this true? Like, yeah. is it true that I'm going to get in a horrific car wreck in this intersection? Like, no, it's, it's not like I'm looking left and I'm looking right. And I'm actually seeing, but my body's having a different experience. And this is true with all of us. Like we are completely shaped by our past. Like our brains and our nervous systems are 100% shaped by the past, by our past experiences, by our childhoods, you know, by various events, you know, in our lives. And it's, I mean, it's, it's no different than let's say getting into a relationship. Like if your last relationship ended poorly and let's say the guy cheated on you, well, then your nervous system in the next one might be on high alert, even if like this is your dream person and he's, you know, perfectly aligned for you and he goes to therapy and he's done his work and he's doing his work and, you know, all the things. Is this true? Mm. That's, that's a great question to ask. It also yeah. is tricky. <laughs> it, it, I would, that's where I was going to go, power. right? Is, yeah, go. Yeah. Let's it, go and, there. and like, you know, is it true? Can you absolutely know that it's true? No. But a lot of times, and it depends on sort of maybe what type of anxiety is certainly with like OCD type anxiety, really it's allowing yourself to have uncertainty, to not be able to answer the question. Like I need to, I can only get on the plane if I know for sure nothing is going to happen. I mean, we can talk about probability, possibility, real perceived threats and all that. But at the end of the day, I can't answer that yes or no, right? I just have to go... <sighs> I can make room for the uncertainty and I am making a very calculated risk here, right? Yes, absolutely. Well, and, and the thing is, is that it, there's, and, and this is, this is, I mean, we're in some kind of deep nuanced stuff here yeah. around anxiety. And so I just want everybody to recognize that of like, <laughs> don't, you know, you're not going to go out there and like try all of this right now and just you know, be perfect at it. Like these are practices, right. but we can, the more we practice and it's intentional. I mean, I assign my clients and I assign folks in the anxiety mastermind homework every week. And sometimes it might just be like five minutes of this particular breathing exercise so that it gets embodied. Yeah. So that it gets locked into your body and your nervous systems so that you can go back to it much easier. And yeah. some of the stuff, like it's taken me five to 10 years to get, you know, I mean, this is a long process and this is like why a lot of people don't start. But anyway, my original right. point was going to be that our feelings are absolutely real. The key is the story behind the feeling isn't necessarily true. Yep. It might be true. It might be true. 
but it's it's learning to separate these things because the the difficulty is that yeah we are having this bodily experience and and i will say as somebody who has a history of let's say dissociation and trauma you know i have an alcoholic father etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean there have been times where my body physically feels like it's on fire so yeah. like anybody listening that's like deep in it right now i feel you i feel you and it's so difficult to just sit with it and that's why we run towards numbing and you know all sorts of coping mechanisms that may not be the healthiest. I mean, there's a reason that we use those, but I really just want people to hear is like your, the experience of your feeling is absolutely real. We're not asking you sure. to turn off your feeling or to shove it down. That's the feelings there because your feelings have been shoved down in the past or they've been ignored yeah. or emotionally neglected or whatever. That's why it's coming up in the way that it is right now. But the, the story of the feeling isn't necessarily true. And that's where sitting with it yeah. over time, again, it's a skill and there's a level of mastery that you can develop with it of like, oh, yep. I know that when this part of my body lights up, something in the present is actually triggering this fight with my dad that I had with not, you know, when I was nine, where he was out of control and ended up hitting me with a belt, you know, whatever it might be. And, and again, like this is advanced stuff. This is advanced. Yeah, stuff. I agree. And I also just want to say too, that like, yeah, a lot of times it is based in past experience, whether we consciously have a connection that we're making to that or not. And there are just like, just like all of our, you know, kidneys are different. All of us process, you know, there's different ways we process insulin and all that. Our brains are different. And, and some people just have what I sort of refer to as like a glitch sometimes where like, this is how your body, this is just how your, your brain processes this thing. And it doesn't mean that something horrible happened to you, but this is, you have intrusive thoughts, right? And it just is what it is. And learning that those thoughts, you know, don't mean anything about your desires, your intentions, your wishes. But I appreciate you naming that all of this is pretty nuanced and in, in a way pretty advanced. Cause I think that sometimes, especially with the wealth of information out there, and I'm glad that there's things like, you know, this conversation out there that people can just tap into at any point. It is useful. Like there are things that people will gain from just listening to this. And just because we can say things like, oh, it's about making room for the uncertainty and the discomfort. There it is. That's all it is. Like it's like you said, it can take years to actually embody to heal whatever might need to be healed inside, but then to to embody this different way of being in the world is not as simple as just understanding a concept. Yeah, and, and really, uh, so I'm a somatic coach. I love somatic work. And what you're touching on and essentially what you're introducing right now is the somatic piece. And you know, for years and years, I went to talk therapy. I'm actually still a huge fan of you know CBT and talk therapy and whatnot. I'm not saying don't do that. I think there is a certain set of the population for which maybe that's not quite enough and it needs to be a both and, and, you know, you can sit here and listen to this podcast, you know, all day long, but like, if you are currently unable, I'm going to emphasize currently unable because mm -hmm. everybody can do this. If you're currently unable to, you know, sit with those feelings and like, you're just constantly like, you're too overwhelmed. And then you run back to your coping mechanisms. First and foremost, I want to say that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Because you don't have the resources and the capacity to actually sit with some of the stuff. That's perfectly fine. So let's normalize running back to our safe spaces. I mean, and even in the healing process, like mm -hmm. I have a client who recently like she experienced three days of just like abundance and it's like money was flowing to her. She got upgraded on a trip, you know, all these different things. And then she just imploded mm -hmm. after three days and she was beating herself up for it. And I was like, Hey, like, this is normal. This is actually really normal. It's just, we, it's okay to expand, it's like stretching, like you expand and then you contract a little bit. But the thing is like, we don't want you to contract so much that you implode. Mm -hmm. Like we have to expand and then it's like, okay, we'll go take a nap for integration and go self-care. And you don't have to stay in this fully expanded state all the time. Like you're not going to get it just because you learned it in your last therapy session doesn't mean 
that you're going to nail it every single time. It's a right. process and we yeah. need to hold ourselves. And I, I wish my therapist were sitting here right now because she would be like, yeah, Patrick's not great at this all the time because <laughs> he thinks that, yep, like he learned the thing and he should just go out in the world and like embody it immediately. All the time, perfectly. All the time, perfectly. <laughs> and, and like we joke around about it and it's like, no, like you, we've got to hold ourselves with compassion in these moments where just because we know the thing, we didn't actually do the thing because it's not embodied. And so kind of getting back to the somatic piece, you know, you mentioned kind of like the glitch in the brain, Mm -hmm. right? There's, our bodies are phenomenally set up to handle stress, to even handle trauma in the moments to keep ourselves safe, safe so that it doesn't become, let's say, so overwhelming that it like truly breaks us. But if that cycle isn't allowed to complete, then that stays with us and it comes out in patterns that don't serve us later. Right. The beautiful thing is this concept of neuroplasticity. Like we can quite literally rewire our brains and rewire our nervous systems because, and the analogy that I love to use is of like roads and highways. So Mm -hmm. this concept of these neural pathways, right? Like you learn, our brains are always looking for the shortest distance between point A and point B. So that it doesn't, it's a survival mechanism. So that our brain's not burning an excess amount of calories. And so, and it's, it's the reason that you can kind of zone out while you're driving. And then all of a sudden you're like, I don't remember anything about the last mile that I drove. Well, it's because your brain has that neural pathway yeah. and that neural pathway is the super highway of I've been driving for 15 years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever it might be. And I just know how to do this and I can do it kind of literally on autopilot. Yeah. Well, in the healing process and the expansion process and this process of, let's say, learning to sit with these uncomfortable feelings, your brain exits the super highway, it exits the interstate and it gets on a dirt road. And if anybody's ever driven on a dirt road, you know that it's bumpy, it's dusty, like you might slide a little bit if there's gravel, you know, whatever. And you're like, whoa, hold on, like potholes, like like this is uncomfortable. And that's what the healing process feels like time after time after time as you enter into new stages of it. But over time, as you learn the new practices and they become embodied and you create those new neural pathways, that dirt road gets paved over and it gets a little bit smoother. And then eventually it becomes the new superhighway. It widens and that is the new path. But at the same time, the old path still exists. Yep. And sometimes we accidentally find ourselves on the old path and that's completely fine. It's right. completely fine. Yeah. I love that analogy. I always have loved that. And, and yeah, I think that's so true. That sort of glitch or your experience of anxiety or whatever it may be comes from painful past experiences or trauma, or maybe it comes more from a neurobiological thing or genetic thing that either way that neuroplasticity is true and it's accessible. And it just takes, like you said, a lot of repetition for that to actually start to really take hold in your body and become more accessible on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. And and, and this is why we call it the work, right? Like this stuff isn't easy. Like healing and transformation is the most courageous process that you could ever enter into because it requires you to look at parts of yourself that maybe you don't love, or maybe that you've shoved into the shadows and you've shoved them into the shadows because they were shamed by somebody else in the past. They were shamed by culture. They were shamed by conditioning, you know, whatever. It wasn't you that necessarily did this. So it's not your fault. And, you know, you're looking at all that stuff and, and it can feel really helpless at times. And it can feel very much like you're, like you're not yourself. Like you're this kind of like, who am I? You know, these are the ways. And there's a letting go. There's a deep, deep grieving that happens. And I think people skip that part. Mm -hmm. is the grieving piece where, you know, they're like, yes, like I'm doing the right things. I'm going to therapy, I'm doing coaching, you know, whatever. And, and, and then they kind of hit this block. And I, and I see this very often where they hit this block. And and if the grief 
very often it can, it can be, it's not always, it can be grief where they've got one hand holding on to their old self and their old ways of being. And these ways of being served you so deeply because they kept you safe. They helped you maintain a sense of dignity and belonging, and they helped you maintain a sense of connection to the world and to yourself, but it's no longer working for you. But it's like an old friend. It's like, Mm -hmm. oh gosh, like, thank you so much. And I have sat down on the couch, you know, in the past and just cried my eyes out over these past versions of myself that were like, gosh, they were trying so hard and they were expending so much energy and, and I can see how tired they are now. And it's like, Hey buddy, like you can rest. Like I spent, I spent a lot of time with little Patrick Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and, and I just show him new ways of being. And he's like, Oh, I'm just so, he's like, wait, I didn't, but I didn't know I could do it this way. And I'm like, yeah, of course you didn't know. Like that's why you did it the way you did it. (laughs) Right. Yep. And we're all just doing our best. And I need this reminder constantly, but but this grief piece of just letting go and being held and seen in that grief as you transition to the new way of being, to the new shape and and to the edge Mm -hmm. of who you not just want to be, but who you know you are. Yeah. I know you recently were reading Anita Johnston's book, Eating in the Light of the Moon, which is a phenomenal book about like women and their relationship with bodies and body and food and all of that, but through the lens of myth and folklore. So I'm like, I wish there was like one of these for just like everyone. And I mean, there are different variations of that for sure. But let's write it. Let's do it. Yeah, right. (laughs) But she has this uh, little story in there called The Log. That's probably the most well-known. And I can, I'm sure it's on the web somewhere. I can put it in the show notes. But but talking about that of like this thing, like you're out in the sea and you're holding on to this. And this is the thing that has kept you floating and alive, right? So you can see that your life is there on shore, but the thought of like, how do I get there while I'm holding on to this big log? Like it's impossible. So I can, I let go of the log. I swim for a little bit and I'm like, fuck, I can't do this. I go back to the log, right? I, next time I swim a little bit further, I try to take the log with me. That doesn't work so good. Right. And then eventually, eventually you start to develop more belief in that possibility that you can swim to the shore without the log. But yeah, it is a grief process. It's like this thing has literally been my companion and kept me alive. So it's, I appreciate so much good metaphor and myth to explore all of these experiences. Yeah. I, and, and that is, I'm so glad you brought that up because that really truly demonstrates, you know, through story, the point that I made earlier about just this expansion and contraction process. Like it's okay to swim back. It's okay to swim back. But then you said like, well, the next time I'm going to swim a little bit further. Mm-hmm. And it's it's no different than, you know, learning a new skill, training for, let's say a sport, you know, I mean, for anybody who's, let's say maybe a runner, like you didn't hop off the couch and just run a marathon right away. Like, you, you know, most people can't do that. At 26.2 miles, <clears throat> maybe at first you just ran a mile. And then, you know, a few weeks later, it was two miles and you worked your way up. The The healing and the transformation process is no different. Yep. It's no different. And as Deirdre Fay says, there should be Olympics for this. <laughs> there should be medals. <laughs> yes. Actually, I joke around my therapist sometimes, like when I have a big breakthrough, I'm like, well, I get a gold star for this. Right. And she's like, <laughs> like it's, it, and, and. I'm only half kidding. <laughs> right. Right. Like, like that was she really actually, fucking hard. Right. Like if I walked in and she actually had gold stars, like I would be so delighted. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's like, mm, no to us. We need to come up with our own version of gold stars. <laughs> it's like, we're always like encouraging our, our clients. Like, how are you going to celebrate this? Right. And I know that whenever I get that question, it's like, my wise mind knows that's legitimate. Like, in fact, it's even part of the reinforcing the new positive behavior, right? right? It's just science. But part of me sometimes rolls my eyes. And so I almost have to like train myself to be like, I know, okay, here's what I'm going to do to celebrate myself. <laughs> well, but the, I mean, my my therapist does this, my coach does this. But the the irony is that 
half the time, like, you know, I'm sure a lot of people listening, it's like, we're in therapy because we don't celebrate ourselves because we don't take the time. And it's always like piling on more and more. And I have absolutely done this with my healing process of like, okay, cool. Have that breakthrough onto the next thing. And yeah. there's just not, I mean, they're the saying it's like how we do one thing is how we do everything. Mm -hmm. And well, the, the one thing that I do and, and have quite done, or let's say, okay, hold on. I'm going to cancel that. <laughs> the one thing that I've done a lot of in the past and that I am doing less of now and will do less of in the future is like not take the time to pause and celebrate. And, and there's a thousand different reasons, you know, why we didn't do this, but it's, you know, it's this kind of prove yourself energy for me. It's just this, like, I'm not good enough. I have to keep proving myself. I have to keep learning. I have to keep achieving. I have to keep, you know, that's, you know, that was my conditioning. That was yep. my shaping and certainly one of my coping mechanisms. And, and so it's, it's hilariously ironic sometimes. Like it seems so easy, like just celebrate yourself, like go eat the ice cream, go out to a nice dinner, you know, whatever. But, but as you and I both know in this process, the, the capacity to hold and experience joy and pleasure and happiness and abundance and like all the good stuff that we entered into this process to get in the first place, they can feel scary. Like they can feel dangerous. Like they can actually not feel great in our bodies. And it's this like woefully ironic thing. And that's the thing. It's like, there's there's so much nuance to all of this. And there's so much paradox, I would say, yep. to this entire process, because the good stuff to somebody, let's say, with a lot of past trauma feels horrible, mm -hmm. or it can feel horrible. It can feel horrible, I should say. Yeah. And, and one thing that I just want to say, too, related to that is like, there's a reason why surgeons don't operate on their own arms and legs right? Like yes. just because you might like maybe some of you listening to this are is in some capacity professionally trained in this shit like me and Patrick are. And yet like we need to call each other <laughs> yes. to help get off the ledge sometimes, right? To like get back into our sort of sense of safety and all of that. Like, and I just appreciate you so much and our friendship for the ability to like have friends like this, that you can do that with. And again, sometimes it's friends, sometimes it is, you know, my therapist, my coach, whatever, but it's, yeah, no matter what you think you quote unquote should be able to do quote unquote on your own, like we still need each other to help us to see different perspectives when we're really in the shit. A hundred percent. I will give you a, an example of this that you already know, but nobody listening probably knows. So in January, 2020, I left my advertising career to launch a mental health startup and my mental health startup took a toll on my mental health and ran me into the ground. And I am somebody who has a huge capacity to sit with discomfort. I have a massive toolbox. I have worked with therapists and coaches and, you know, all these people and for years, like I am incredibly well resourced. And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying yeah. that to just drive home the point of what I'm about to say. I reached a point in running my startup where I was so burnt out, but not recognizing it, that it eventually turned into depression, full-blown depression with mm -hmm. suicidal ideation, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And to drive this point even further home, let's say with the suicidal ideation, I found myself in the midst of a panic attack in December, I think it was December 2021, for the first time in a long time. But I recognized it. And, and anybody listening, do not do what I'm about to say. Like, just don't, don't try it. Don't do it. Don't be like, oh, maybe I can do that. I'm, this is not a teaching. This is, I'm demonstrating a personal experience here. I found myself in the middle of this panic attack and I sat there and I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm resourced enough and skilled enough to recognize it first and foremost, and then be like, okay, well, there's got to be something underneath here. And I asked myself, all right, am I going to go there? And I was like, yeah, let's go there. So I went on the back porch and I kind of created my own little container for myself. And I sat there and I was like, okay, I'm going to go into and allow myself to fully experience this panic attack. And, and I got underneath it and I heard this little voice and it was like, if it's going to be like this, I don't want to live. 
And that was the that was the suicidal ideation voice. And I could recognize that part. I could recognize that part. And I'm going to again pause and emphasize like this is really advanced stuff. And this is the point at which, you know, you can build your skills to this point eventually, but don't try it right away. Yep. <laughs> don't try it right away. Like we need I've had a lot of guidance and a lot of training, and a lot of resourcing in being able to do this. And I heard the little voice and I was like, okay, because I, and I'm a believer in sometimes it's like, yeah, you got to get closer to the thing. Let's move towards the thing instead of away from it. So I was like, okay, let's move more towards this. And I was like, say more. And I was like, well, if it's going to be like this, like, I don't want to live, you know, whatever. And I was like, okay, well, like take that further. And it was essentially saying like the voice, the suicidal ideation voice was saying like, you want, I want to die. I want to die. And I said, okay. And I took it even further to the point of like, okay, like how far do you want to go with this? Cause I was testing myself, but it was yeah. more, I you were knew talking it was to the part. You weren't necessarily fully merged with the part. Exactly. And the thing is I was in it and I could, I was, I had the 30,000 foot view mm -hmm. of like, I'm still safe in this and I'm yeah. okay. And I also simultaneously had the I'm in it view. And again, yeah. this is a skill. This is a skill that everybody can develop yeah. over time, not necessarily to like this extreme with this mm -hmm. thing. I hope you never have to do this, but you can do it with anxiety. You can do yeah. it with these parts of yourself. And, and I went so far as to, and then all of a sudden it just clicked. It was like, oh, I'm not actually looking for a physical death. Like there's no part of me that wants a physical death. And I could, I immediately, when it, that clicked, like that part of me just tapped into like, gosh, like there are so many cool things that you want to do in this world. And so many people that, you know, you can surround yourself by and whatever, but this other part of me, the depressed part of me, the, the part of me that was like, no, I want to die was like, oh, I, I saw that. And I was like, okay, something needs to change. Yeah. Something needs to change. And I just started talking to it. Mind you, I share this story to say, you know, to your point of like, even skilled professionals like need help. I never told my therapist about this. <laughs> Still to this day. Oh, no, she, she, oh, no, she knows say. about it now. <laughs> yeah. She knows about it now. But because I was able yeah. to like kind of guide myself through mm -hmm. that experience, I was like, okay, I'm good. When I was like anything but good. And, and it was six <laughs> weeks later that I was yeah. in a therapy session and my therapist, Christy looked at me and she goes, Patrick, you're depressed. And I burst out laughing because I was like, oh my God, you're right. I've got every symptom. And then that's when I told her, I was like, including suicidal ideation. I was uh, like, there oh, was shit. this time uh, a few weeks ago. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I probably should have told you about that. And she was like, you think? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And, and, and anyway, I, I share that story to like really deeply drive home your point yeah. of we all need help. Like we all need yeah. each other and kind of, let's say, bring this full circle. Like we started off this conversation by talking about polarization and searching for belonging, but really like disconnection. And that story was just me being disconnected from self, me being disconnected from taking care of myself in this process of building my mental health startup, because I was so, and this is like the catch when, you know, I see this with like entrepreneurs and people like we're, especially in, let's say healing professions or whatever, we will throw ourselves aside to save another person. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't mean save, like to serve another sure. person. I'm a full order to and to go after our dreams, you know? Yes. To go after our dreams. And like, we're so lit up by it, but we abandon ourselves. And that's yeah. the thing I had abandoned myself to the point where this part of me was like, can we, like, you haven't taken a vacation in three years. Like, can we please go and just have some fun and not be like focused and serving everybody else. And, yeah. and it was just, it was a disconnect. And I think that's so much of a core, the core of, let's say, depression, anxiety, and a lot of mental health issues is just disconnect. Yep. And like, we need each other. Like, we need each other. And so anybody listening, action item right here, like, who are your three people? Like, who are your top three people that you can just reach out to, call at any time, shoot them a text, open up to, and reach out to yeah. them this week. Reach out and to all of them. And if you don't have three, yes. that's your homework. 
right? And I know that can feel like a motherfucking daunting task. If you're like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to make a new friend and not only a new friend, but the kind of friend I could call on when I'm in extreme distress. Yes, you are. (laughs) Like That is all of our homework as human citizens and human beings is like, we do need each other. And you don't need 10 close friends, but you need a few, right? Some of them might yeah. happen to be related to you. None of them might be related to you. Doesn't matter, but you need them in your life and they need you. Yes. And that's the thing. Cause so many of us, like we feel like burdens, right? Where like, if I ask for help, then I'm burdening the other person. That's actually not true. I'm a firm believer in And I learned this lesson a few years ago of like, when you ask for help, the right people who are available for it can and will show up. That doesn't necessarily mean like your best friend, your best friend might've just had a baby and like, normally they'd be there for you, but they can't because they've just got, they don't have the capacity for it right now, but the right people will show up. And for those people, whatever you ask for help for, it serves them to because it gives them an opportunity to show up for you, to share their gifts, to hold space, to do whatever it is that lights them up inside to the point where they answered the call. Yeah, They answered your call for help. It's a yeah. symbiotic thing. Exactly. And symbiotic, it's mutual, it's reciprocal. And even though a related concept of transactional. Like it's not that it's not tit for tat. However, I think part of the gift is like, I know that I, because I have the capacity right now to support this person, like, and I am happy to do so because I love them and care about them. And like, yeah, I'm taking whatever time out of my day to do this because I love and care about them. And also like, I know that when I show up this way in this relationship, they're also going to show up this way. And again, it's not going to be a 50-50 all the time because we have different scenarios going on, but like we we simply can't expect people to show up for us if we don't show up for them. So there is a level of like that's what reciprocity looks like. And so whenever like you for instance do need support, when I'm like, "Oh, yes, yes, my turn." Right? And cuz like I know there's going to time come a time when I need that from you and that it's not this tip for tap, but it's this, it's this mutual support. Yeah, actually I'm, I'm reminded, I think it was like a year or two ago. It's probably two years ago where like I, cause it, for the longest time, like I did not ask you for help for anything. And I remember the first time that I did, you messaged me back and you were like, Oh my God, finally, like I have been waiting for you to ask me for something. <laughs> and we had a good laugh about it. And it was yeah. just this reinforcing pattern of, like, and, and okay. So going back to this point of like, it takes time. This is a process, you know, et cetera. The whole asking for help thing. I first learned that lesson. It was probably 2018 and you know, it's 2023. Now I was on a men's retreat last month and that lesson came back around full circle in a bigger way, in a deeper way. And I realized so many other ways in which I was, I still was not asking for help. And I asked the guys on the men's retreat for help. And one guy was like, I'm going to check it. Well, he offered, he was like, would it be okay if I just checked in with you every single morning for a week? And like my system, my body was like, no, 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 you don't have to do it. Like it's too much or whatever. But logic, I was like, yeah, like I need that. And then over to, and it was like the third day I actually received it and i was like oh this is really nice like just to like be cared for and again i mean going back to this like you know expanding our capacity for joy expanding our capacity to receive you know all these different things like this is part of the healing process because our condition tendencies for so long have blocked these things or said oh oh no like you know if you experience too much joy then like somebody's gonna get mad at you and they're gonna cut you down and and this is you know kind of going back to what is bad bitch therapist, right? It's the person that tells the truth. It's the person that lives authentically in their truth. And for so many people, and I mean, I think women, especially it's like, well, if you get too big, like someone's going to cut you down. You know, it's not just like the patriarchy, right? Like men, let's say suppressing women, it's women on women too, right? Like every Which woman arguably has... is still sometimes internalized patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was actually going to yeah. make that point as well. So I'm glad <laughs> you mentioned that. You're 100% right. 
but like, but the thing is like, people don't necessarily know this, you know, sure. it's, it's like, no, like we need to actually be able to look at all the parts kind of individually and see it's like, okay, what do they trace back to? But, but yeah, it's like, if you're a bad bitch, like moving through the world, like in your authenticity, someone's going to try to cut you down. Like you should actually mm-hmm. expect it. Right. Not exactly. in a way of like, you're manifesting it and kind yeah. of secretly passing a spell. Just do not be surprised when it happens. Cause it will. Exactly. Don't be surprised because you're like you being beyond the edges of somebody else's capacity to live in their authenticity is going to feel like a threat to that person. And they're going to try to cut you down to be the size that they need you to be, to feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. Yep, man. I could just keep this conversation going for two more hours. (laughs) Yes. Always. (laughs) But let's let people know where to find you online and what you're offering right now. And of course, all that will be in the show notes too. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so you can find me, best ways to connect with me is on Instagram. So it's at murph.live, M-U-R-P-H dot live. Just shoot me a DM. Website's coming, but at, at the core, I'm a somatic coach and I'm a facilitator. I generally work with people who have let's say some sort of like big dream that they're trying to achieve and they feel disconnected from where they're at in their life and where they want to be. And they've quote unquote done everything right in their life. You know, they went to, they got the education, they got the job, you know, maybe they've got the relationship and you know, whatever, but they're like, okay, something's off and why? And, you know, from a somatic perspective, like we work with the body, I work with the body and just getting people deeply connected with themselves, with their intuition, with their inner voice, with their song, so that they can go sing it in the world because somebody needs your song. Everybody is needed. Every single person listening to this podcast is needed. The world needs your gifts. And it's just coming into unapologetic alignment with those and being able to, you know, we talked about like being able to hold everything that comes along with moving to the edges, moving away from the, the 50, you know, that middle 50%. And I do, I work with a lot of women, a lot of women and who, you know, maybe have wounds of the masculine and kind of need to be witnessed in that safe masculine presence so that they can then attune themselves to that safety and actually go and experience it in, in, in the world, like in the mm-hmm. wild. Right. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Everything comes back cool. to somatics. Everything comes yep. back to the body. And I know um, you work with people one-on-one, you have your an- healing anxiety mastermind, you have who knows what else I'll probably con you into doing a retreat with me at some point. <laughs> oh, that's going to happen. We need, let's just start planning that. <laughs> let's do it. 2024. <laughs> we're, let's just announce it right here. Like it's we don't know announced. what the retreat is going to be, <laughs> where it's going to be, but 2024. It's retreat. going to happen. Watch <laughs> out for part two. Thank you, Patrick, so much. You're always such a light and I can't wait for people to hear this conversation. Thanks, Val. I appreciate it.